Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Question number one has been withdrawn. At question number two, I call Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what safeguarding training NHS Board are required to provide to non-clinical staff who are handling interaction with members of the public. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the staff governance standards, which is applicable to all staff employed by NHS Scotland, requires health boards to appropriately train and develop staff and provide a safe working environment. The national policies on personal development and managing health at work st uh, supports boards as employers of NHS staff and to identify and provide necessary training for staff according to statutory requirements, the job role and individual training needs. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Uh, people who require to use NHS service will go through a process of dealing with non-clinical staff before seeing a medical professional. Many of these patients may be neurodivergent or require tailored communication. It is important that staff can identify needs and transmit the medical information in a way that is effective and appropriate for the neurodivergent patients. Can I ask the Scottish Government how often it monitors and reviews the type of safeguarding training required for non-clinical staff with regard to these specific needs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Sign Officer, the national policy is to ensure that NHS staff, in whichever role they are working, that they are provided with the appropriate training to undertake that role. It is then the responsibility of their employer, the NHS Board, to ensure that they are receiving uh, the necessary training. Therefore, those non-clinical staff that are working with individuals who have uh, uh, neurodivergent uh, uh, conditions, that they should be appropriately trained in order to do so. However, if the member has some specific examples where he feels that has not been the case, if he wants to uh, write to me with the details of that, I'm more than happy to look into the issue for him and to ensure the issue has been appropriately addressed. Question number three has been withdrawn. Question number four is not lodged. Question number five, I call Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to improve lifelong learning in Scotland. Minister Graham Day. Presiding Officer, uh, our lifelong learning offer already caters for a range of learner needs. However, last month I set out to Parliament the steps that I will be taking to further improve lifelong learning in Scotland. As part of our reform programme, the Scottish Government will take the lead on skills planning, simplifying funding and take a central role in the development of apprenticeships. I have also commissioned a short independent review of community learning to be led by Kate Still with recommendations to be made by summer 2024. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful for that response and I hope we can agree across the whole of this chamber the importance of lifelong learning. Last year in its adult lifetime skills, a literature review um, there was a quote that literature on the weakness of the current adult skills system in Scotland is also relatively sparse. So after 25 years of being a devolved nation with the SNP government in charge for 17 years, in the light of this, can the minister tell us why well, there are still significant gaps in lifetime skills data and what the government is going to rectify, when the government is going to rectify this and when is it going to be identified, and more importantly, the need met? Minister. Mr. Officer, let me begin with a note of consensus. I completely concur with Mike Martin Whitfield on the importance of this. And I also recognise that he has genuine interest in all this topic. So let me offer just three specifics around what we are planning to do, um, because I think it is more important what we are intending to do and what we will do rather than what has happened previously. Um, and I hope this provides them with some reassurance uh, on the seriousness of my intent in this area. The National Career Service that we will be offering, we intend, will be an all-age service, not aimed primarily at young people. Important though it is that we get that aspect right. We are also working with employers and colleges in particular to shape an agile and responsive short qualifications offering, which meets the needs of businesses and employees uh, looking to upskill to meet changing needs. Then, of course, there is the review of CLD provision to identify where in the country we might have to improve that offering in order to provide people of all ages uh, with a chance to improve their quality of day-to-day -day living and, of course, where applicable access to education, training and employment. Now, I agree with him about the need to have data to underpin this. That's part of what the review is looking to do, to give us a clearer picture of what's happening. But actually, I think we know there are some issues here. We've had them identified through the Withers and others' reviews. 
and I'm, I'm more inclined to simply get on and try and fix some of these issues. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, and I have to say I very much welcome the Minister's evident commitment to improve lifelong learning in Scotland. I think that is a commendable uh, position of the Scottish Government. But I wonder if the Minister could <coughs> indicate excuse me, what assessment has been made as to how to promote this objective in my Cowdenbeath constituency and indeed across the Kingdom of Fife. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Annabel Ewan makes it's a very good point, and it, it's, it's actually at the heart of why I've commissioned the review, because in order to address the point that she makes and others, we need to best understand what's working well, what isn't working well, and where there are pockets of good practice and try and roll them out. So absolutely, uh, raising awareness of access uh, to CLD offerings is important, but I, I want to better understand the position across the country first so that we can take steps that are informed by robust information. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to attract and retain staff in colleges. Minister Graham Day. President Officer, operational decisions, including those around attracting and retaining staff, are matters for individual colleges, and the Scottish Government expects colleges' staffing complement to be in line with the needs of their learners and their local and regional economies. The Scottish Government, through its Fair Work Agenda and through its work to support the adoption of the teacher qualification and further education, uh, continues to support the college sector in attracting and retaining college support staff and lecturing staff. Colin Smith. Officer, a week really passes when a minister doesn't say in this chamber the reason we don't have industrial action at the moment in the NHS in Scotland is because of the actions and the intervention of ministers. So what does it say about the failure of the government to intervene in their colleges that this week college staff and the EIS feel a union have once again voted overwhelmingly to take industrial action? What will the minister do in the coming days to avert this action and ensure our college staff get a fair pay deal, given that Audit Scotland have already recently warned that we face a recruitment and a retention crisis in our college and more cuts and the lack of fair pay is simply going to make that worse? Minister. President Officer, I'm, I'm literally just off a call with the Unite Union on this very subject. I've engaged with all the trade unions and the employers. As Colin Smith well knows, uh, ministers cannot enforce uh, a pay settlement in, the, in this sector. And he also knows that this is a sector where the industrial relations have been toxic, to say the least, for eight of the last nine years. So I am uh, actively encouraging all sides to try and find a solution. Um, and th that is the role of ministers in all of this. Now, there is a longer-term issue about the industrial relations in the college sector. I'm intrigued by the fact that all sides recognise that, yet we haven't been able to find a solution to it. We need to find a solution to the pay dispute currently, but we also need to find a solution uh, to the longer-term systemic problem in the sector. And if uh, all of the actors in this are as genuine as they tell me they are, I think we can resolve both. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What won't attract and retain staff is a proposed cut of 8%. That's £58.7 million to the Net College resource budget. Yet recruitment of staff and students has to happen right now for next year. So, Minister, when precisely will colleges know exactly what their budgets will be for next year? And just how brutal are the cuts going to be? Minister. Down officer, as I think Mr Kerr knows, because he is knowledgeable about these things, there is a process post the publication of the draft budget where the SFC works directly with colleges and universities uh, to determine the specifics of the budget. That process is underway. I'm not cited on the exact details currently, though I will be in due course, and I would anticipate further detail, precise detail, to emerge in the next few weeks. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister knows that there are redundancies proposed at UHI Shetland. What confidence can be given to the community that in the future we will have a Shetland College that meets the needs of local learners and local businesses that have differing, differing sets of skills requirements? Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm grateful for the question. Beatrice Wisher and I have engaged directly on this matter quite recently. Um, she's right. It's a legitimate concern about the situation at UHI Shetland. What I can assure her is that both, both UHI as a, a, an entity and the Scottish Funding Council are engaged directly with the College at Shetland to try and ensure that its future is, is, is there, is, it, along the lines that she would indicate. But it also has to be a sustainable 
uh, position that it gets itself into. So there are some challenges there currently, but I think everyone is at, um, participating positively in trying to find the right solution for the college and for Shetland. Question number seven, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I draw members' attention to my register of interest to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the City of Edinburgh Council to discuss its housing emergency declaration? Minister Paul McClellan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government regularly engages with the City of Edinburgh Council concerning our shared efforts to end homelessness and reduce the number of households in temporary accommodation. On the 7th of December, I met with Housing, Homelessness and Fair Work Committee convener Councillor Marr to consider housing supply matters. On the 21st of December, I discussed budgetary matters, including housing, with Edinburgh City Council leader Cammy Day. And just yesterday, I also met with the Scottish Cities Alliance to discuss housing, which included officers and council leader Cammy Day. Continuous dialogue between officials is facilitated through forums such as the City of Edinburgh's Council uh, Homelessness Task Force, which last met on the 13th of December. Scottish Government officials and their City of Edinburgh counterparts will next meet on the 23rd of January. Sarah Boyack. Can I welcome the engagement of the Minister? That is much appreciated, but say um, it's not just Edinburgh that's declared a housing emergency. There are other councils doing it now. And to say that last week, 781 people applied for a single council house in Dreghorn, so it's a now issue this housing emergency. And can the Minister say what action the Scottish Government will take imminently to tackle our housing emergency, whether it's bringing empty homes back into use or getting moving and building new housing, both general needs and social rented accommodation? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. On specific issues, you will be aware that obviously we had the uh, uh, announcement of the £60 million allocation uh, of, of acquisition funding, which we're discussing with Edinburgh at the moment about various uh, sites that are there, also talking about allocation policies. The member will also be aware that we've attended a number of round tables in Edinburgh, which the empty homes issue was particularly raised. So we're working with uh, Edinburgh in regards to empty homes. There's a few other things that we're working with Edinburgh on. There are a few strategic sites, such as Granton in the west of Edinburgh, that we're working with to try and develop as quickly as possible. Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer, and I also thank the Minister for his committed engagement on the housing emergency in Edinburgh. And with appreciation to the financial constraints, which are real, the situation in Edinburgh is becoming more and more serious and is more acute than elsewhere in the country. So as well as having the engagement and the official engagement in this new year, 2024, can we expect action from the Scottish Government and the City of Edinburgh Council working together to really tackle this emergency? Minister. Yeah, thank you Mr. Uh, to the member for, for that question. As I said, we, we are engaging with Edinburgh on, on a regular basis, such as issues that talked around about strategic sites coming forward and the acquisition policies in terms of that yesterday. Yesterday I met with the Scottish Cities Alliance and we were looking at innovative ways of financing which of Edinburgh has used before, such as GAM funding and TIF funding. So we're uh, engaging with Edinburgh on that issue and we'll continue to engage with them about bringing housing forward as soon as we possibly can. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We need to find solutions and part of that is looking at our land supply issues uh, here in the capitals. Can I ask the Minister um, whether or not the Scottish Government will agree to audit all public land, not just council land and Scottish Government agency land, but NHS land as well, to look towards what development sites might be available to help reduce the cost of affordable housing development significantly. Um, we know many sites across uh, the Edinburgh area will not necessarily be developed as part of the local plan. So I hope that's an opportunity and a positive suggestion to actually undertake a proper audit. Minister. Thank the member for that question. I think we're kind of touching on planning issues, but in regards to land that's available, for example, such as NHS land, I've already engaged with Paul Lawrence from the Edinburgh Council on that and can be there to discuss that. And I'm awaiting some evidence coming back from them about land that is available uh, and how we can work to bring that forward. And we make land that's not in the local development process, but we are we're engaging with them already on that issue. Co-Cab Stewart. In November last year, the City of Glasgow too declared a housing emergency and I understand from my colleagues on Glasgow City Council that our city has around 1,500 homes less than it needs to meet demand. I know the Housing Minister meets regularly with representatives from the Council, but what work is ongoing to address the specific needs Glasgow faces, including the challenges set out by the Home Office's fast-tracking on asylum claims? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I met with Glasgow City Council to consider the city's housing supply challenges on the 12th of December. 
and we'll meet with him again on the 23rd of January. In October, the Migration and Refugees Minister wrote to the UK Government to request funding to support local authorities to manage asylum pressure. However, no additional support was forthcoming. This is deeply disappointing and a matter ministers continue to press alongside our Welsh Government colleagues. Clearly, the Home Office's approach is pushing people into destitution and its impact in Glasgow, Scotland's largest dispersal area, is particularly acute. We will again call on the UK Government to recognise the devastating impact of their, of their approach on local authorities, communities and asylum seekers. Question number eight, Paul Wilkane. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to discuss out-of-hours GP services in Inverclyde. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government engages regularly with Greater Glasgow and Clyde, as it does with other health boards, on a variety of issues, including the provision of out-of-hours services. Healthcare Improvement Scotland are supporting the health board directly in relation to the service provision in Inverclyde to ensure quality engagement is taking place around any permanent change to that service. The Scottish Government has been cited on this process. Paul O'Kane. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, communities across Inverclyde in my region are deeply concerned about the possibility of permanent reductions to out of our services availability and what that will mean for uh, local communities. And I want to pay tribute to local campaigners, local councillors, in particular Martin McCluskey, for all of their work in pushing the case uh, for the value of this service forward. I think it marks quite a contrast to the member for Greenock and Inverclyde, who, according to reports in the Greenock Telegraph, has already given up the fight and accepted that his constituents and mine will have to put up with reduced services. So does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the value and importance of a full out of our service in Inverclyde? Will he listen to local people and their views and deliver more than just a weekend only out of our service, which is what local people deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Second officer, the member will be aware there has been a full consultation exercise undertaken by Greater Glasgow and Clyde that closed uh, last month, which has presently been analysed by the board. And obviously, Healthcare Improvement Scotland have a clear process in looking at any what may be classed as a major service uh, review. I think, of course, it is important to recognise that the reintroduction of the service, uh, the part time service on a Saturday, also complements the existing home visiting service, which remains operational throughout the evenings, weekends and overnight. Uh, but of course, it is important that in any decision that is arrived at, that the consultation exercise takes into account the concerns and issues which have been raised by the local community during the course of that process. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, whilst it is frustrating that the GP out of hours service in Inverclyde is to be limited to Saturdays and public holidays, Having attended one of the, the Health Board's public consultations on the service changes, I am aware that just over a third of people from Inverclyde who, who need to see a GP out of hours are given a face-to-face -face appointment, with the remainder giving either video, telephone or home appointments. And I do want to see uh, a full service uh, reinstated to Inverclyde, but not at the extent of losing the A&E, which was, which was very much uh, highlighted at the consultation that I attended. With, if Mr O'Kane was there, he would have heard that. But certainly, presenting officer, um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it's important that we do consider the full context in which these decisions have been taken and ultimately do not mislead the public, as some have done in the press by suggesting that Inverclyde does not have a GP out of hours service? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Senior Officer, I, I recognise the concerns and issues which the member has raised, and I have made this point in terms of the services which are available, including the home visiting service, which remains operational throughout evenings, weekends and overnight. It is important that people are not left with the impression that there are no services being available within the Inverclyde area. I do agree with the member uh, that we would like to see greater coverage uh, of, our, of our services across Greater Glasgow and Clyde, including within uh, Inverclyde uh, the Glasgow, including within Inverclyde itself. Uh, and I uh, want to make sure that the process that has been taken forward by the board as part of the consultation exercise is in line with the Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, guidance on these matters. And at the conclusion of that particular exercise, we will have a clearer understanding as to what is the most appropriate path to deal with out of health services within the Inverclyde area. And briefly, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the problems with not having out of hours GP services is that people simply will present at A&E, adding more pressure to what is already an overstretched department, particularly in Inverclyde Royal Hospital, as is the case right across Scotland. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain what additional resource support he can offer A&E departments to deal uh, with this influx of patients when there are no other services available? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, President Officer, I think we have to wait to see what the outcome is of the consultation exercise in Inverclyde, but I do not disagree with the point he is making about the potential impact that it can have on any &E departments if there is no access to out of our services. So, for example, this winter there was specific work taken in order to make sure there was greater resilience within our out of our services across the country, which has been effective over the course of uh, the course of the last uh, month or two because of the actions which we have taken. Notwithstanding that, I do recognise the concerns he's made, which is why the consultation exercise and outcomes from that are ones that we will look at very closely in terms of the impact it could have on wider services.